Hi, everybody. The guest tonight, you read all about her work. You read about all the accolades that she has received. So I'd like to get right to the heart of the matter. Our guest tonight is crazy talented. And from all accounts, she is also the nicest and the loveliest person. Please welcome the one and only Elizabeth Olson. Hi, I have a big glare on me. <laughs> so we want to ask you a lot of questions about the series because we think it's beguiling. It really is. That's the only word to describe it. But we want to start from the beginning. And how did you start? First, how did you start in the business? Um, I started, I mean, I think I had to start, I had to start and stop. I, I, I was curious about acting as a kid, um, because I did so many theater camps. I did a lot of musical theater camps starting when I was eight, but I was in ballet since I was five. I always took singing lessons, like being a performer was something I always loved. And I auditioned for maybe six months or less of my life when I was 10. And I wasn't um, allowed to participate in the Nutcracker that year because I was missing so many um, ballet classes from these auditions. And it then I realized I, I want to act when I'm an adult. I don't act when I was a kid. And that was quite a process and learning experience for me at 10 to make a pros and cons list. And then um, like my dad asked me to do. And then I... Uh, and then I just kept training. I kept participating in whichever way I could, whether it was school or camps. And then I started taking it much more seriously when I was in high school and started going to multiple conservatories during the summertime and went to college for at NYU at Tisch. I went to the Atlantic Theater Company. And while I was there, they had me audition for some of their um, off-Broadway productions right. as an understudy. And so I started understudying when I was in college. And through that, I met my agent, who I still have today. And so that's how it all kind of happened for me. Well, that's why I was curious, because I read that you didn't really get an agent until you got to Broadway. And I said, well, how did she get all those roles? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, I mean, I didn't get to be on stage. I understudied off Broadway and Broadway, two shows that were both panned and terrible, but I, and I never got to go on, but she saw that, um, my agent saw my name in the playbill and that I went to the Atlantic theater company, the Atlantic theater school, Atlantic school of whatever they call themselves. <laughs> so, but, um, and she represented the woman who, um, looked after all the students as an agent, Kate Blumberg. And so she asked Kate about me. And that's how I met her. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was all through casting directors at first who just um, met me through auditions for Atlantic Theater Company. So, but um, I also read, I read it on Wikipedia, so you never know whether it's true hmm. or not. But, wow. <laughs> but uh, that you actually went to study theater in um, Russia for a semester? Yeah, I did my third year in college. I had an opportunity first semester to go abroad and it wasn't through NYU. It was through the Eugene O'Neill Theater in Connecticut and they have a program for undergrads and it's, and I went to Moscow Art Theater School for a semester and it was spectacular. The theater in Russia is, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but I've never seen better theater in my life than any other country. It was absolutely spectacular. And it was in rep, every theater was in rep, repertory theater. So I got to, um, if, I mean, this is a film academy, sorry. So repertory theater means, um, means that, act, that the plays only happen a couple times a week and then the product the company does another play and they have all these different plays that they rotate through in one week as opposed to a play for six months so you could see one actor play three different parts in a week at different production companies or at different like theater companies and um 
it was some of the most creative theater I had ever experienced in my life. And it was, it was um, for that reason, it was really uh, an amazing experience. So, yeah, I was surprised when I read about Russia because most people would like choose London, you know what I mean? And- yeah. <laughs> I loved Chekhov <laughs> and I loved, um, I loved the, um, I loved the history of the Americans going to Stanislavski and the theater company he created. I really loved the history of Russian theater um, and how it infiltrated the United States. And I also, um, it was, I loved how their theater was so necessary to their culture because the arts became the voice of the people through all these different um, dictatorships. And so I, so I, I just found it, all the art to be so rich coming from Russia. But is it, I mean, at one time, it, the Russian theater was the thing, Stanislav, mm-hmm. it was the thing. Do you feel like it was still, is it still viable, do you think, these days? I, I think there's something they're doing that, um, I mean, this is, I went 2009, so this is a long I time. Oh no, two, yeah, 2009. That's how long ago. <laughs> so it was a long time ago. And it was also like before uh, there are all these new, uh, you know, invading Ukraine, becoming a homophobic country. Like there are all these things that happened when I wasn't there um, that happened after. And so being there, it just felt like the theater scene was so alive and it wasn't about reviews. It wasn't about um, stars they had a couple theater stars, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't this, it felt different. It felt truly creative um, and freeing. It it was like watching a bunch of David Lynch plays or something. Like there was something that was bizarre about all of them and incredibly unique. And so it was, um, I do think that there is something that they were doing there that wasn't like, that's not like any other place. I think a lot of theater holds on to traditions and Russia honors their traditions by continuing to um, advance whatever the last tradition was. Even at the school, they don't teach the Stanislavski method when he originated it, they continue to evolve it. Right. And so that's that, so that it felt, it felt very Russian, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> so now you got an agent at a yes. tender age. Yes. And, um, what was the next step? Next step, I, so I was, nine, I was 19, before I went to Russia, I told her, I was like, you know, I'm not ready for an agent. I have to finish my acting conservatory first, but I was interested in auditioning while finishing my liberal arts part of my um, degree. So it took me five and a half years to graduate college. But um, I started auditioning and um, I did not get Shakespeare in the Park the summer after my junior year of college, but I did get um, two movies. One was a bad movie I did called Peace, Love, and Misunderstanding, but it was a great group of women I got to work with and learn from, and Bruce Beresford directed it, and so I got to learn from very experienced crew people, and then, um, and then I overlapped filming Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene that summer with Peace, Love, Misunderstanding, both filmed in um, upstate New York, And then that was it. And then I was kind of on for a ride that I wasn't aware of because I thought I was going to do a lot of theater. I didn't (laughs) know I was going to do a lot of film and I've done barely any theater. So all that Russia stuff was for naught. Yeah, hopefully not. Hopefully it lives somewhere inside me. (laughs) I mean... It was incredible because for, with that movie, you got so much uh, attention in Sundance. Both the movie and you got so much attention. And it holds up. I just looked at it again this week. It really, really holds up, you know? It and is. it's a story that we kind of know, but from such a different point of view. And, um, uh, you know, the tone of it and your acting in it and, It was just incredible. Okay, so uh, when did you get into the universe of Marvel? Because really, here you were in the independent world and suddenly you are 
in the biggest screen, so to speak. I just think Marvel is an alternative universe. We just live in another universe. <laughs> um, it, so it, what happened was, is I, how long had I been working? I think I had just started working. Uh, for like, oh God, a few years or something, maybe a few years. And I didn't know why I wasn't being considered for larger movies. And my um, agent or manager said, well, because you don't seem like you're interested in, in them because you only do independent films. And I was, so I started taking these like weird general meetings that are super awkward with um, heads of studios. <laughs> And it was um, this uh, guy named um, John Jashney, who used to be at Legendary, who's no longer there. And um, when it was before I did Godzilla and I met with them generally again, before I, Godzilla was a thing. And he told me, you know, we're just an incubator. The people that are gonna cast you are gonna be our directors. We have nothing to do with it. So why are you here? <laughs> And I was like, I don't honestly know why I'm here. I like your, I like the movies you guys are making from a commercial and artistic standpoint. And um, I just want, I just want to be a, be in your radar and that's it. And I stayed very close friends with John Jashney um, after that for a few years and ended up doing Godzilla for them. Um, and then that, that turned into, I also had a general meeting at Marvel and Joss Whedon wanted Aaron and I, Aaron Taylor Johnson and I to be the, the brother and sister in the second Avengers. And we had just played, played husband and wife in Godzilla. And we just both were like, are you doing it? I'll do it. Like, let's do it. Let's do it. And um, that's kind of how it happened. I, I didn't have to audition. I didn't have to sign like a six or nine movie contract. Um, so it didn't seem like such a big decision to make at the time it's it seemed like I got to play a part of this moment in cine, like film history this you know Marvel cinematic universe part and I had no idea that I would be doing it for six and a half years or however long it's been and by the way you're talking about uh, Aaron Taylor's it looks like you did a uh, movie with Jeremy Renner Mm -hmm. then, of course, you did the series with Paul. It's like yeah. you'll forever have co-stars from the Marvel Universe. It looks God, like. I hope so. If I could work with Catherine Hahn again, then you know I'm doing some something is happening. <laughs> it's bright in the stars for me. Yes. So um, I'm going to turn it um, to the student because it's really for them, and you have no idea how big a turnout for you. I'm just looking oh. at the numbers. I cannot believe my eyes. I think that, I think that, um, you know, because in Wanda and in Black um, Widow, I think that women now are basically taking agency and the lead in those movies mm -hmm. that they didn't before. And the women are following now and entering, you know, into that universe. I myself, because not even because of the movie, but because of Wanda, I'm just like, oh, I can't wait to see Doctor Strange and <laughs> what's going to happen to the twins. And you know what I mean? But I think that before it was really, oh, it's a bunch of guys fighting, but now there's a different energy and it just, in fact, I just want to tell you that one of the instructors has a niece in Russia who is 13, 14, and she was mm -hmm. devastated that her parents didn't let her stay in the middle of the night to watch the Q&A. Oh so, my gosh. So 13, 14 in Russia. So it shows you what a giant success the series is. Yeah. You know, it's a global success and it's for all the ages, really. Yeah, it's very... Um... It, it it was not something that anyone told me about, you know, a while ago. It was something that I learned about when my contract was ending with Marvel for the second time. <laughs> and um, Kevin Feige told, who runs Marvel, told me what his idea was um, before it was expanded upon. And I was nervous about doing TV for Disney because it was a new platform and it didn't exist. And I had just done a show with Facebook um, 
called Sorry for Your Loss that no one really got to see because it was on Facebook. And then they stopped doing scripted television after our second season. So, you know, it, so I, I was nervous about doing a new streaming. And so the, the fact that it did what it did goes against like every impulse I had about my, my fear, um, which is, you know, well, let me ask you something, because I don't think you can really predict mm -mm. how something that you do, what's going to happen with it. But as an actress, could you at least say there was a challenge and I think I rose to the challenge and I feel good about it? Sometimes. I mean, I do. I do. I'm very self-critical and directors that get to know me well know I like all the information and so they'll end up sharing edits with me and things like that um because I just I'm a I'm not it's not that I'm a control freak I just actually my mind rests if I the more information I have about why we're doing a schedule like this and why we have to reshoot something or you know I just I I actually chill out knowing why um and what was I even saying we were talking about what we were talking about how you feel about your work, oh, work. as how it does in the world. So I think sometimes I leave a job feeling like, you know what, I put it out on the table, everything else, you know, I'm proud of my work. And sometimes I think, you know what, I don't, I don't, like I look back on certain jobs and I thought, you know what, I didn't prepare. There was a time in my life where I felt like I was taking the job for granted and I was just excited to be working. And I wasn't even... I don't even feel like I was committing in the same way that I started to again. I would say when I started my, uh, I start maybe in, when I did Wind River. I feel like I kind of turned a page with Wind River and a lot of stuff I did before that, with the exception of the first few projects I did, I kind of I kind of got lazy to me because I I'm kind of obsessive and disciplined and I felt like I could have done better. Yeah. So I'm going to open it up for the student because it's really for them. But I just want to say the last thing about Wanda, and that is, um, it was just, I use the word beguiling because it was just in terms of the content, the structure, your work. I mean, every segment was just something else. And that I really, um, and even after nine episodes, I still needed to read about it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not enough because it was so intriguing. And I think that's part of the success uh, of it because it was layer upon surprising layer that kept coming and coming and coming, you know, like peeling an onion and revealing something. So. Um, thank you very much for your work. And let's uh, go to the students because they ask interesting questions. Okay. Thank you for saying that. We have a question here from Melissa Medeiros from our South Beach campus. Melissa, we've enabled you to unmute your microphone. What is your question for Elizabeth? Hi, uh, thank you for answering my question. My question is, what's the first thing you do to research and approach a role? Oh, it's fun for me to answer right now because I am doing that right now. And I guess my first step, because it, my, the, the, what I'm researching right now is actually a true story. So it's, um, I'm, I'm in this stage and anytime there's source material or there's a true story that, that becomes the beginning is trying to figure out what the, what the, what the source material is or what the reality of the situation is. And then it goes to, um, just reading the scripts. Well, I mean, right now I'm doing limited series, so reading the scripts a bunch and finding the character's voice, which then informs my body because you start thinking about where her voice, where her breathing's coming from. Um, is it an accent or, you know, is there a dialect? Is there a different register in her, um, in her body that, that she would, that she would hold her voice? What does that say about the person as a character? And that's that's the that's the beginning stages for me. And then everything else, like hair and anything physical that I need to do, becomes informed by I think that voice that I that I that I try and find at the very beginning. I mean, I I care a lot about vocal work and about dialect work, and I'm not 
necessarily like really great at accents. I just care a lot about where someone's voice is and what that how what that means about the character. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Tristan Odell from our New York campus. Tristan, we've enabled you to unmute your microphone. What is your question for Elizabeth? Do you ever convey a sense of you within a role? Do you say to yourself, I can see Elizabeth doing this? Or do you strictly forbid yourself from building connections like that and creating a new character or a you for the role? So I, um, that's an interesting question because I do feel like I am fully whoever I am playing. They are fully me. It's just that there are different external factors like um, clothes, time period, hair, whatever, but it, it's a part of me that I'm trying to express or part of uh, some, 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 there's something that I have to connect to at this person's core. Um, I never refer to myself as like, even when I'm on set, I don't say, oh, I don't think I would do that. I always say, I don't think she would do that. Um, and I don't, I don't take, I try not to, I don't take on the, the, I think the, the emotionality home with me, I'm pretty good at disengaging, but you know, work is stressful for everyone, no matter what you're doing. And so you can't, it's hard to disengage completely depending on your day, but I, I do try and create, there's like, there's this person I'm trying to be, and then there's me. And, um, but I, I can't do that person without there being something about their core that is um, important and connected to me. That also like gets me going. I had a teacher that said, um, instead of an action, and you have to have an action, right? In the scene. Um, and she said, you know, when you're kind of lost and you're in the middle of a scene, what's your strap hang? Like when you're on a subway and it jerks you and you're about to fall, what do you hold on to? What is, and it should be short and it should hit your gut. And um, I kind of think about the core of the person in the same way. Like what's, what is a really important word like perseverance or whatever that is like in me um, that is in this other human and that I can always remember that am I going back to that, that leading this person through their, through their opinions of the world or how they see the world from this point of view. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Grace Brunetti from our online campus. Grace, we've enabled you to unmute your microphone. What's your question for Elizabeth? Hi, I was um, just wondering. So there's like all kinds of actors that start off as actors and then they end up like in the future, like directing or screenwriting or something like that. Do you have any interest in directing or writing your own film? Um, I'm, I'm not a great writer. I have attempted writing and I don't really have the discipline and the patience for creating the word. I, what I do love is editing someone's writing. And I, so in that way, I love collaborating as a part of being a writer. Like sometimes I'll take turns. Um, right now I'm in that, I'm developing a children's animated show and so I like taking turns in that way um, with the other person I'm writing with. Um, directing, I, I think I might do it one day, I, but it, it has to be whatever it's going to be. It's got to be something that I'm, um, I'm so in love with because I do enjoy as an actor uh, being a part of a project and leaving. And I like also being a producer a lot. I love producing, um, which I have gotten to do a couple times um, for my TV show, sorry if you're lost, that was on Facebook that no one saw. Um, and <laughs> and um, I, I caught a bug and now I kind of act like a producer. If I am uh, number one on the call sheet, I then think of myself as someone who is a leader because you are, and that's an important part to know that. Um, and I try to make sure everyone feels like they're being taken care of especially with WandaVision, because we had people who had never done Marvel before. And, um, and it's important to make sure that they feel protected and taken care of in ways that maybe um, you can help them with. So uh, I, love, I love being a leader, but I don't necessarily need to tell a story right now as a director. So I, that's why I haven't done it yet. Thank you. 
Uh, we have a question here from Jonathan Strouder from our LA campus. Jonathan, we've enabled you to unmute your microphone. What is your question for Elizabeth? Hi, um, and congrats on your Emmy nomination. Thanks. Um, I wanted to know, you asked my first question, which was how did you, did you know that after Age of Ultron that your role would expand to what it is now? And you said you didn't, so that's my first yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> my, um, my second question is, um, do you have a favorite episode of WandaVision and do you have a favorite Marvel film that you've been in? I think WandaVision's my favorite Marvel project um, that I've that I've been in. I I think be, I think it's like it's more at my alley <laughs> than any of the other ones um, because of how odd it is or beguiling is the good word. Um, and the first question was uh, about Wanda favorite episode. My favorite episode was. I think the seventies, because it was the most absurd form of the sitcom genre in my mind where um, everything just feels like really inauthentic. And that was fun to play and really kind of, it was more, it was like that we, we got to do a lot more physical comedy. It felt like in that episode or I, I did because of the pregnancy of it. And it was also the episode where the facade starts to break and fade. And so playing the levels of kind of towing the line of what's the real reality, how much are we giving away to the audience? How much is she aware of? And keeping up the facade um, was, was that was a, that, that episode was fun to navigate. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Daniel Ricken from our New York campus. Daniel, we've enabled you to unmute your microphone. What is your question for Elizabeth? Hi. Uh, in many ways, uh, Wanda straddled the line between villain and hero while living inside the hex. Uh, what do you think that those blurred lines reveal about humanity and how Wanda processed her grief? Oh, I love that question. I was actually somehow that I was talking about that kind of a bunch today in interviews. Um, New York Times. Yeah, funny like that. Yeah, I was just talking about it. Um, so, yes. In the comics and in our movies, we don't really know how to label her as a, as a villain or a hero. And I kind of go into every character hoping that you um, question their intentions or those are the characters I'm most interested in playing. And I think if there's any kind of theme in how I choose a role, it's that at the heart of it. And I, I, I just find it more interesting to deal with um, characters that have questionable morals, but that you still understand their humanity and can understand their perspective and the why of whatever they're pursuing. And I, and as an, as like kind of a larger idea, I, I didn't think about this until today really, but I think that's kind of how I approach the world and how I approach different people's beliefs and ideas and I don't think um playing a villain to be evil I mean I think there are there is evil in the world but I also think there are more interesting intentions that create better drama to watch than just um evil or um heroism or you know altruism and so I so yeah so I I hope it just makes us all kind of realize that we just never really know. Um, and I think that's what stories get to do in a great way is, I mean, I, I just watched Mayor of Easttown. I feel like that did it in a great way. Like you just don't really ever know what's going on in people's lives. And that's, what's fun about whodunits and things like that. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from Molly Turdeman from our online campus. We've enabled you to unmute your microphone, Molly. What is your question for Elizabeth? All right. Oh, it looks like Molly's having difficulty with her mic. I will ask her question for her. Uh, Molly asks, was there any point in your acting career where you felt like quitting and what did you do to overcome that? Yes. Um, I think anytime I have to do press, I think about quitting. I really don't like press. I, um, I don't like photo shoots. 
I don't like dressing up in clothes that aren't mine. I, um, I don't like my words being twisted or, uh, the idea of what I was saying was misunderstood and, um, whether it was intentional or unintentional. And so I think I go through phases where I just get so frustrated and angry <laughs> that I, that I just think, why the hell do I do this job? And then I I'm on a set and I feel, um, like I have all the answers in the world. Like I'm the reason I do this job is because I love doing this and I love collaboration with people. And I love, I love the, the work that we get to do. And, um, I think I really needed to rediscover that a few years ago, which was an important moment in my life. Thank you for that. Um, we do have a question here from Caden Vandermeulen from our LA campus. Caden, we've enabled you to unmute your microphone. What is your question for Elizabeth? Uh, hi, um, I just wanted to ask how you would rate um, improvisation at, as, a, uh, as an acting exercise. Um, I think it depends. I think there are ways that, I, I, I mean, I think for comedies, like with Ingrid Goes West, we improvised so much. Um, and then in Wind River, when Taylor Sheridan, our director asked me to improvise a scene in the movie, when I found a dead body, I was like, fuck you. <laughs> like, that's not something you improvise. Um, that's something you write and give me the words for, because I'm not a federal agent. And this is like, uh, it's not a fun, it wasn't fun for me. Um, so I think improvising can be good if depending on the stakes and the characters, and um, I think the thing that's so joyful when it comes to Ingrid Goes West with, with improvising is it's all about making one another uncomfortable and finding as much awkwardness in so many moments. And we both knew our characters well, we knew the scenes well, we knew, you know, we never like didn't know our lines or something. And so it was, it's the more, the more prepared you are, the more free you are to improvise in certain circumstances. But that's, I, th I think it's a tool sometimes and not not for others sometimes. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Maddie Dryden. Maddie, we've enabled you to unmute your microphone. What is your question for Elizabeth? Uh, hi, Lizzie. Um, so I absolutely love Sorry for Your Loss. It is my favorite project of yours. Thanks. <laughs> I, seriously, I feel like it's it, it kills me when you say it's not watched or anything but <laughs> well, thank just... you for watching it and knowing that it existed that was hard <laughs> to discover yeah. it yeah well thank you for being a part of it but anyway question um I do want to talk to you or ask you about I guess the the depth and complexity of the emotions that your character had to feel um specifically I wanted to talk to you about it's in season two, episode four, and it's about when you or Lee and Matt are discussing about pickle, pickle Greer. So, what was that like for you to not only have that um, raw emotional distress of knowing that Lee lost Matt, but also that added layer of the fact that you kind of had this child that was an idea that now can't really become into fruition? So, what's that like for you to play as an actor with that emotional complexity? Um, I, uh, um, so I think there's lots of different ways to go about dealing with like the extreme emotions and when it comes to like how an actor prepares. And for me, um, it's important. It's sometimes important to fantasize and it's sometimes, you know, not fantasize because no one wants to fantasize about not being able to have a child with the person they want to have a child with because they're dead. Um, but I, I think in that show, because I felt so comfortable with Lee um, and I was in a place in my life where that was enough, literally just um, imagining what um, that would feel like. And I don't, and I'm a very sensitive person. Um, it's very easy for me to access the dark, sad parts of me. Um, and that's just who I am. Uh, Catherine Hahn calls me a sensitivo, which, I, which I'll hold on to. <laughs> and um, uh, so I feel like sometimes that's enough. And then other times um, it's not. And you have to then 
think about what the common, what the reaction is that this woman could possibly have with something that maybe you have experienced. Like I haven't lost um, a parent, thank God, or um, someone very close to me yet. And I've lost people that I'm close with, but the, the, the intimacy of that death, um, I haven't experienced, but I have experienced loss that felt like a death um, or a grief experience that felt like a death, even though it was a grieving experience. So it's, um, so I think then I, then you think about that thing and then you're like, ah, and then um, you have the lines. And so for me, that's, those are like the two ways I think that I worked in that show. Thank you. Oh, we have a question from Anna Paula Ruiz from our online campus. Anna okay. Paula, we've enabled you to unmute your microphone. What is your question for Elizabeth? Well, hi, Elizabeth. First, I want to tell you that I love your acting. And I feel like you're one of those actresses that really can embody a character. Thank you. So what I would ask you is, what can I do as a screenwriter to help you embody your characters? I think um, the more, the most... So you're a writer, right? Yeah. I think um, with screenwriting, the more specificity, the the better. And I think that means like even in the like mundane, um, I find it interesting in writing when um, when there's just something that this person does all the time. And then that informs what like even if it's not an important part to the story, like she's always cooking or she's always um, you know, there's picking at her clothes or something that informs this person's state of mind. And I think that's all, those are kind of fun things for actors to create as well on their own that's inspired by the script. But I think those, those, those elements to characters are interesting entry points. Um, and then also you just have to love your characters. I think a lot of times even um, I think sometimes in order to find humor, sometimes people like don't love their characters um, and you can feel that and then they feel one dimensional. Um, but if you love the people you're writing as horrible or odd or mysterious as they can be, like if you just love them, you will create more three-dimensional characters that other actors will then fall in love with to get to play. Um, so I guess that's that's what I that's what I would say. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Miguel Garzon from our New York campus. Miguel, we have enabled you to unmute your microphone. What is your question for Elizabeth? Uh, Hi, Elizabeth. Um, Hi. You have played Wanda in so many films, and I'm curious if you discover any new aspects of the character when you had the opportunity of playing her in WandaVision that is a longer thing than just a movie. Yeah, I, I did. I absolutely did. I, um, I feel like what I discovered was her as a, like who she was as a woman. Um, as opposed to a young woman or something. Like I felt like she, this idea of um, creating a family nucleus from herself and her love um, and being a mother was so new and enriching for who this woman is and what drives her. And that loss of not getting to grow with her own family um, and that desperation to need to, to build her own, um, that that was like a desperate need of hers was revelatory as opposed to her just dealing with the loss and putting band-aids on it by, by transferring love and family to other people. It became um, a desperate need to create that family and became a much more um, even human story, I feel like, um, because, because of that, I, our writer, like, knew it from the beginning, Jack Schaefer. And, and she, I think she did a beautiful job as a mother as well, um, articulating that. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Michelle Purdy. Uh, Michelle, we've enabled you to unmute your microphone. What is your question for Elizabeth? 
Hi, um, first off, congratulations on your Emmy nomination. It's so well-deserved. Hey. Um, I've been a massive fan of yours for like ever. Kodachrome and Ingrid Goes West are two of my all-time favorite movies. <laughs> um, so my question is um, when serving in two different roles on a project as both um, an actor and a producer, like in Sorry for Your Loss, which I also saw and I love so much, <laughs> how, does that, how does that affect um, your approach to the role or the character or like vice versa to the production of everything? Or do you try to keep them as two separate entities? Um, I, 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 I like being a part of any kind of uh, collaboration where there's like a back and forth between the writer and the actor, the director and the actor. And there's not, that's not always the case. And I'm okay working kind of in any atmosphere, but when you do get to be in a collaborative um, family, then it's fun to be a producer because you get to be a part of the earliest, um, the earliest character, the earliest character arc building of, of a series of an episode. Um, and you, I, you know, and then you get to read outlines and see where that's going and then give your two cents. So for me, when I was doing, sorry for your loss, I, I had, I had, I filmed Monday through Friday. I left my Saturday to review edits and scripts. And then my Sunday was my memorizing day. And so it's just harder be doing both because especially if you're doing a TV show, cause it lasts for a long time. <laughs> um, it's like six to nine months and of, of that kind of schedule, but it feels very rewarding because you feel like fully part of the fabric in every way of the show, even, even, in, even it's, you know, faults, you're a part of it. And it was a big learning experience for me as an actor. Excellent. Uh, we have a question here from Gabriella Lewis from our online campus. Gabriella, we've enabled you to unmute your microphone. What is your question for Elizabeth? Um, hello. First of all, I'd like to say I'm a really big fan of your acting. And I'd like to ask you a question about um, which role or scene has emotionally impacted you throughout your career? Oh, wow. That's a hard question. Um, I think on a personal level, um, what has impacted me most, I think, oh God, that's such a hard question. Uh, I think Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene really, uh, affected my life and my career in a big way. And I learned a lot from it. And I think I, I think Sorry for Your Loss was a show that I had to grow on quite a bit. Um, and I had to learn how to find my own uh, voice from a critical standpoint and feeling confident in my uh, opinions and voicing them and how to voice them and how to voice them without offending people um, and how to voice them in an encouraging way. And uh, uh, so I, there's a lot, of, a lot of learning that went on um, on that set. And I was very grateful to have that opportunity and it, and it I feel like really informed how I approach working um, now. And so I'm very grateful for it. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Tanya Bloom from our New York campus. Tanya, we've enabled you to unmute your microphone. What is your question for Elizabeth? Hi. Hi. Um, this might be a really silly question, but you've mentioned earlier that you love producing and um, that you've thought about maybe directing in the future and that it, like whatever you do in the future, it's got to be something that you really, really love. Um, so my question, I guess, would be, who or what do you want to be when you grow up? I mean, keeping everything in mind that you've already accomplished. Um, yep. That is not a stupid question. I love that question. I, um, I am, I love meeting people who are, um, much older than me who have had multiple careers and stages in their life. And I find it inspiring to learn that someone 
uh, transitioned different jobs there um, and just kind of went with what was what was there at the moment. And I think when I grow up, I would like, while I grow up and continue to grow up, I, I would like to uh, continue to listen to that and not be scared of change. I think that's what's hard about sometimes maybe getting older is the fear of change. And um, I'm, I would really want to be able to listen to it and transition in life if, if that's the thing that's the right, that's calling you. Um, I'm not a very like woo woo spiritual person, but I do feel like, you know, when, when something needs to be put to bed and move forward. And I think, I think that one of the most admirable things to watch people do is change careers at a, at an adult time in your life because they, because it's not satisfying them anymore. And I just think it's so brave to do things like that. And so I, I think that's what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we do have a question from Jimmy Norris from our New York campus. Jimmy, we've enabled you to unmute your microphone. What is your question for Elizabeth? Hello? Hi. Hi. Um, just want to say thank you so much for being here today. And um, we, I especially love your work. Uh, my question is, what experience in your career uh, do you think that any uh, anyone coming up in this industry should avoid and what and how did that experience strengthen your resolve in, in becoming an actress? Oh boy. Um, I don't know. I feel like something to avoid. Oh God. Sorry. Big pause. I I think no, like uh, I, I, I do think things are transitioning because of because of what where the world is today and where the country is today and um, the work that's being done by so many place different places that there are things that are different already about the industry. I do feel like um, when you believe that you are. Uh, not being treated well, that, um, you should never think, uh, but I am not the, I'm, if I say something, then I'm not going to get a job. Like, I think your, your self worth and dignity is always, um, more important than that. And the only times where I have felt pressured to have to, or not pressured, where I, I pressured myself to have to say something, um, where I felt like something was inappropriate, um, I never got like, and this is, a, I'm talking about my like, you know, first year of work, not like now, cause I think that's a different conversation, but, um, I didn't have a crazy response. Um, so the other person was concerned. So I got lucky, but if I was fired, I'd also be like, well, fuck them. So I think that's what I would say about avoiding is avoiding, um, allowing someone to obviously uh, treat you or someone else in an inappropriate way in any way that's inappropriate. Um, I don't think, uh, we get to give people with, um, egos and geniuses. I don't think they get passes. <laughs> that's how I feel. Thank you so much. I know that, uh, time is coming to an end, but there are a couple questions that have been in here repeatedly that I'd love to um, throw to you before I turn this back over to Tova. Um, one of them is uh, how different is it? Um, and what is your advice for preparing to act on stage versus film? Um, uh, I think the biggest difference is utilizing your whole body. Um, I think when we're acting, we are acting to the, the, the lens, like to the size of the lens and we forget how to utilize all of us um, through space and what that means. And so I think physical warm ups are very important, no matter like what you're doing or like a vocal physical warm up, but it's essential when you're doing theater, um, especially in rehearsals, because then you are connected to your body and you can make choices that will inform what the play is going to end up looking like. Um, so I think that's 
that's different. And then other than that, I think it's, is it, it's like a, I think it's a mammoth quote that acting is acting is acting. If it does, it doesn't matter if it's like film, TV or theater. Um, it's, you know, you're always just kind of, it's either you're acting for a larger audience or you're acting for a small audience. And there are tools that are technical to, to do both. But the truth that people want to see um, is the same. It's just with in a different, setting. Thank you. Uh, the other question that has uh, been repeatedly in here from a lot of the students in the audience is what advice do you have for uh, aspiring actors that are that are just coming out of school and, and how to keep uh, pursuing your dreams? I think I think that there's so much I mean, I would we were just I was just learning about Aubrey Plaza making a short at NYFA that got her into NYU. And I do, I do think that the first step is like training and um, knowing what you're good at um, and then knowing how to seek work, knowing confidently what you're good at. And um, if you always remember, if your intentions are pure and you have a drive, um, then you're, then you're just, you're going to be persistent and something's going to work. I, you know, there's, there's so many ways to, to put things out in the world today that I'm like learning about all the time. Um, and I don't mean like TikTok or Instagram, but I do mean like there, there are ways, so many opportunities to get work seen. I don't know about them because I, I'm, I think it's changed drastically from 2009, um, but yeah, that's, that's just know that, that, you know, persistence and, and, and discipline is important and being prepared. You're only, if, you know, you can only get mad at yourself at the end of the day, if you are unprepared, you can't get mad at anyone else. Thank you so much for answering all of the questions from our students in the audience. Tova, um, I know you have a few things that you'd like yeah. to ask yeah. Elizabeth before we go. Absolutely. Um, Elizabeth, Dr. Strange. Yeah. <laughs> a multi-view of madness. So I read it's coming March 22nd. So it means that you already yeah. filmed it? Yeah, I filmed it during the pandemic, the whole thing. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I filmed for nine months during this time. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you shoot it? We, uh, we shot in England. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, okay. during the last two lockdowns. Okay, not so bad, not so bad. No, it's great. You, and so can you give us a little tip, a little hint, a little thing about it? I mean. No, I can't. <laughs> it was really hard. Um, Sam Raimi is lovely and I, I got to learn a lot from him. Um, and it, you know, is it was, it was odd going from WandaVision and bringing this character to a different film that felt more based in the Marvel films. And um, yeah, I felt like I was like putting on old shoes. <laughs> oh, I think that everybody's kind of buzzing, really trying to figure out after Wanda, what can be done in Doctor Strange, which direction it's going to go, all of the kind of stuff. So you're not going to give us a little hint, huh? It's a very scary movie. Really? Yeah, it's like Sam Raimi, old Sam Raimi. Like it's, you know, he's right. trying to create a, they're trying to create the um, the scariest Marvel movie. Not so bad. Yeah, so, I, so there's that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the twins, the twins. Yes, my okay. boy. So are we gonna see something called Young Avengers? I have no idea. I don't even know if actually, if you even ask Kevin Feige that, I think he would honestly say he doesn't know. They really plan like phases at a time. And then they, after those complete, they move on to the next phase. And it seems like from, you know, my perspective that they, that that could be a possibility, but I don't think they have a real plan for that yet but you know, they keep all their options open. It's interesting because when he was here, 
he, people ask him, what about an LGBT character? He said, yeah, we're going to have that. What about, you know, this and that transgender? Yes, we're going to yeah. have that, you know? So I think he knows that they're going to go there. Yes. You know, he doesn't really know when or, but they have the characters that they, that they want to explore. And I think they're using Disney plus and the TV shows to really expand the world um, of Marvel. Yeah, I know that they got me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, no, I, I really, uh, I'm looking forward to see what happened with the twins. And because there was such a part of your life in Wanda and such a surprising part of it. Yeah. They grew so fast. They did grow so fast. And those boys <laughs> were the sweetest boys. And then they disappear and you're like, no, no, <laughs> come back, little Sheba. <laughs> Elizabeth, I really, really have to uh, say that um, you really showed your colors by agreeing to come here, by um, keeping your word, you didn't try and change it. You didn't say I was nominated for Emmy tonight. And <laughs> I just want to go drinking. And I just really don't want to spend time with everybody. Instead, you were here. You were a gave of yourself. You um, offered the best advice. You cared. And I think that it shows character. I think it shows... Uh, discipline. I think that it shows why you are the star that you are. I think that we have just seen a little bit of you and I just can't wait to see what the rest is going to be because it's always authentic, it's always shiny, and it's always exciting. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. You are so kind and thank you so much for having me and inviting me to participate. And good luck in everything. And Thank we will you. be there at Emmy really cheering you on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye.